Welcome. Uh, welcome to this collaboration between the Telberg Foundation and the Strathmore Business School. I'm Alan Stogut, Chairman of the Telberg Foundation. Uh, we are gathered today to talk about disruptive technologies uh, at a time after COVID. We're really not going to talk today much about the ongoing pandemic, but rather how innovation, great technologies can create a better world, uh, perhaps a world that isn't better, and, and how, how do we try to optimize the good and minimize, as you saw from the title of, the, of today's webinar, uh, the bad and the ugly. Uh, I am joined today by Dr. George Njenga, who is Executive Dean of Strathmore University's Business School, known to many of you, and a partner that Telberg has worked with in the past uh, very successfully. Welcome, George. In Thank addition, you. Thank you. Alan. In addition, we have three uh, amazing individuals. Um, Ann Goldfeld is a, um, among other things, professor of medicine and pediatrics at Harvard. Um, she has a robust history in um, coping with, dealing with, thinking about, and trying to solve pandemics, both a clinician and a medical doctor uh, who is, is uh, working on, on this problem as well. Uh, Dr. Rafa Yuste, neuroscientist, Columbia University, uh, who is uh, deeply involved in thinking about the brain um, and the dramatic transformation of our understanding of the brain, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And, and finally, Fio Omaneto, Tufts University uh, Professor of Engineering and of Biomedical Engineering, um, who is working on transforming how we make things, what we make things of, how we cope with a world that is not necessarily based on, or how we create a world not necessarily based on hydrocarbons. Uh, the one thing that the three, Rafa, Ann, and Theo have in common, among many other things I suspect, is that they are all past winners of the Telberg Eliasson Global Leadership Prize, uh, which we'll talk about at the very end of this, of, of, of this workshop. What I'd like to do though is to start uh, George, with you, um, you've thought a lot about innovation, about technological change, about how to accelerate development, growth, uh, and the quality, not just the quantity, of growth in Africa. So perhaps you can set the stage a little bit uh, for a few minutes on innovation and technology and how you think about, uh, how you think about the transformative capabilities of technology. George? George, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Once again, thank you, Alan, for inviting me, Dr. George Enga. I'm the Executive Dean of Strathmore University Business School. I'd like to first say thank you very much, Alan, for having set up these partnerships with our agreement and uh, for bringing us to the global stage in the discussion of technology in a time of crisis like this one. Um, for us in Africa, we have many problems um, with reference to the development of the advanced countries. We lack innovation and technological uh, support at the agricultural level. We do not have good policies for land distribution and management of, of production. Um, we have uh, significantly in my humble opinion although others may have different figures we have a significantly low level of urbanization um, we have a significant lack of interconnectivity especially internet interconnectivity and so on and so forth and my feeling is that um, this crisis COVID-19 has brought so much to bear for us however Funny enough, I still insist it's an enigma because the main technology we feel is most important for us is the technology to bring cash money to all the citizens who are largely staying in uh, far-flung rural areas. Uh, here in Kenya, we, for instance, have approximately 55 to 60 percent of the population staying in the rural areas and that thanks to the expansion of the land they can live and live through a subsistence cropping system okay 
So how do you get money to these people? How do you encourage uh, clear markets for these people so that the economic, economy can grow? How do you get healthcare services to these people? And technology for us is therefore at the very basic level, what we are calling the fourth revolution uh, innovation. So for instance, uh, we are innovating in a big way on ambulances for healthcare. We are innovating in software applications here at Strathmore. We are helping the government set that up right throughout the whole country. How do we uh, assess healthcare conditions at very far-flung villages in, in maternal healthcare services, and this time COVID-19? So we have questionnaires going through uh, social platforms to people on the ground and so on and so forth. Um, though COVID-19, has not caused havoc from a healthcare point of view. So the figures like um, we may have discussed before, as of yesterday, were approximately 50,000 people infected in the whole of Africa, a population of 1.3 billion people. And of those 50,000, uh, 2,000 deaths, that's a percentage of about 4%. And I think that if we are to use uh, healthcare applications and uh, get people who already have mobile phone capability on the ground, we are approximately, six, in Africa, it's 60 to 83% uh, availability of mobile technology to the people. And this makes it very easy to reach them and get information from them to, through to a centralized place. Um, there are difficulties we are facing. For instance, um, you know, because of tr lack of, um, transportation, the lockdown on human movement and goods movement. These things are making us think now of another angle of transformation, which is in fact, integrating the markets within Africa. In Africa, we have approximately, uh, of all our export business, can you imagine our intra-African business of that 1.3 billion market is only about 17%. And this depends on who is talking and who's doing the research, but I would say it's between 15 and 20% anyway. So if you look at uh, US and, and Canada, you look at uh, Europe, the, the, the exportation and importation business going on is at the range of more than 80% or at least more than 70%. So we have a big gap in integrating Africa to develop more markets. Um, yeah, I could tell you much more uh, of what we are doing here in Africa uh, regarding technology and innovation. But the one thing that we cannot, um, we, we cannot fail to see is that we did not really get affected or enjoy the third revolution, industrialization. So we do not have the same problems of, for instance, a lack of energy resources for the people as much as Europe or the United States or China or Japan would have because most of our people are subsistent. Yep. So let me stop there and you'll ask me more questions. <laughs> I, I will certainly do that, George. And what I'd like to do is segue to Theo because you just gave him the opening between the third revolution and the fourth revolution. Uh, and that's really what we're going to talk about today, I think, a little bit more, the fourth revolution, where we're going next, where technology can take us. And Theo, your Silk Lab, your work on biomedical engineering, you're thinking about how to change both how we make things, what we make things of. As you think about um, Africa, as you think about the world, as you think about the problems of climate change and so forth, um, how can an engineer make a difference? And how can we unmute you is the next well, question. First, first of all, yes. First of all, an engineer has to click the unmute button in order to say something. And then, um, well, uh, I think that there's, uh, there's, there's, tremendous, there's tremendous opportunity. Um, for context and background, I think, you know, the way the way that I think of materials uh, and the way that I think of, of, of some of these, of some of the problems um, and some of the problems that George touched on, in fact, um, is, is, really, is really moving away a little bit from a traditional model of sourcing materials um, and, uh, and, going into, and going into natural sources of materials, sustainable sources of materials 
Um, so in a certain sense, if you will, move away from mining, uh, from mining the earth and going back to growing materials and which would be, which would provide arguably a sustainable, uh, a sustainable alternative. All of this without sacrificing function. So without sacrificing the technology that we're used to, uh, because everything has to, you know, we're used to a certain level of, um, of sophistication at this point in our in our commodities that I don't think that we'll be able that we'll be able to give up for the most part. So um, I think you know for context we work we work with a lot of a lot of naturally derived materials in our um, in our light motif is really what if you could take I don't know your phone if what if you look at your computer your phone uh, your containers your everything that is around you and what if these things could uh could be eaten so what if they were the what what if they could double double as food what if you could disperse them in the environment without any without any harm what if uh, they were able to communicate um biologically and by that i mean change color in the presence of a virus contain a medicine or uh or relay the the type of information that objects don't usually relay or store things that usually that usually get degraded. So then uh, you really redefine manufacturing, you redefine product applications through these functions, right? Because, uh, because suddenly you don't need to refrigerate a drug. Suddenly, suddenly you, can, um, you, can have, uh, you can have an object that you can put in the yard and melts away and, and acts as compost and it's is truly compostable. So you redefine manufacturing, you redefine product applications. Uh, through the redefinition of the material functions. So if you have these materials that do things that perform like the materials that you're accustomed to today, but have all these hidden functions that weren't there before, uh, then you go to jobs and societal impacts and, and the redefinition of technology expands also the context of where it can be, where it can be used. So to George's point, um, you kind of build up a very intimate link between the artisans and the and lower resource settings with high technology uh, on the that that we're more accustomed to in commodity goods, which is very very which is a very very important interface. And the example that I always give is that a shoe that a shoemaker that makes shoelaces um, is uh, can be regarded as a craft. They know how to weave something that is tubular and the utility. Uh, the utility doesn't sound global or doesn't sound as globally impactful until that thread is made slightly differently and it becomes a vascular replacement or becomes a medical device. And then suddenly, suddenly you're, you're bringing together two worlds that were really quite apart. And the, and the artisanship and the skill of a craftsman actually can lead to much better problem, much better solutions that have very high impact in in very, very important, uh, in very, very important scenarios like, like health care, for example. And this is just one of the examples. So I really believe in, um, in a lot of these opportunities, mostly because the materials, the materials become, uh, become really multifunctional and have a lot of applications beyond what we're accustomed to, besides the fact that they can perform as well as the materials that we're using today. So, um, so I think that's a little bit of introduction, at least to the ethos of our, uh, of our lab. In, in so, so the fourth revolution or the fourth transformation, um, you might be lucky, George, to have missed the third, it sounds like, if some of what Theo's talking about can be done. But before I go to Rafa, I want to remind everyone that we are recording this uh, so you'll be able to access it later on, first and second. If you have questions, there is a question and answer function. If we don't get to your questions today, uh, what we're going to do is answer those questions and post them on, on the Telberg Foundation website and hopefully George also on one of your websites. So we do want to engage your questions with our answers, or at least their answers, uh, even if we don't quite get to them during this hour. Uh, Rafa, let's build on that. Uh, the, you're thinking about thinking and you're thinking about how and experimenting and trying to understand how the mind works and in, in in past conversations you've talked about the potential for 
uh, another renaissance. Tell us a little bit about what you think the next years might bring in terms of the understanding of the mind and the consequences of that understanding. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, greetings from the epicenter of the pandemic from New York City. Um, so uh, actually, so one, one thought uh, that I have in the middle of this crisis is that uh, this is not uh, business as usual. And in fact, uh, if anything, my state of mind is one of, of anger uh, because uh, it's a little bit like uh, watching uh, a slow motion train wreck. So uh, humanity is going through this catastrophe that's affecting globally, not just our health, our economics, but we have people in our team that know how to deal with it. So uh, we have the experts in our team. We just not, we haven't played those players like in the, in the soccer team. They were all sitting in the bench and the, the experts that can deal with this type of things are the scientists. So I think this is, uh, we need to change the rules of society, bringing the team of people that are actually experts and know, um, know this, this business uh, and, and put them in charge. Uh, and uh, I think, I think uh, this brings to bear the importance, the urgency of science. Huh? And as you were saying, um, Actually, um, if you look back in history after every major catastrophe or crisis in the world, there are also positive changes. The last uh, big one was the Second World War, and that led to the uh, building of the UN, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, European uh, community uh, was born after that disaster. So this could be a stimulus for all of us to try to to change the rules of the game and make a society which is anchoring science, uh, where science and medicine actually have a, a, a living role in governance uh, uh, so that we can, we can steer the, the world uh, properly in the future. And as, as you were saying, uh, in my mind, I mean, I may be parochial, but in my mind, one of the most important things that science can contribute is the understanding of the human brain, because the brain makes our mind if we understand how the brain works scientifically, we'll know how our mind works from the inside. And we are a society, we're a, a species that uh, it's a mental species. So absolutely knowing who we are from the inside is going to enable us to build the rules for a better society. And that's why I talk about the humanism, like a new enlightenment. I think this is a time to bring in the, the, the troops to, uh, to get from, uh, all the, the investment that society has made in the last decades and centuries on science, technology, and medicine to really put them to bear and, and, and help uh, redesign the, the rules of the game so that we don't go through these types of disasters uh, again. Uh, Rafa, I think the very quick follow-up to that, you are certainly right. It's the first time in my life that I have seen scientists standing next to prime ministers, standing next to presidents, uh, not just for show and tell, but actually to provide guidance and advice. Um, and, and that's a good thing because my biggest fear about the 21st century had been that we were living in a world where expertise uh, was disposable, where everything was equal because no one, because of the internet, all information was equal. We didn't prioritize experts nor expertise. And perhaps one of the outcomes of this crisis, as you suggest, um, is, to, uh, is to reverse that equation, to say, no, there actually are people that have experience, that have relevant information, and ought to be in the decision-making rooms, not just amateurs. I, I, think, yeah, I think it's not, it's not enough what's going on. Um, uh, uh, what I imagine uh, is a situation, uh, a rational situation, in which humanity intelligently uses all of its resources, and uh, it, not just to have scientists stand by the prime minister as a decoration, but have prime minister that have PhDs in science, um, uh, have, uh, if you just look ahead, I mean, this COVID crisis, you think it's terrible? Well, if you look ahead what we have, the challenges are even worse, huh? climate change, uh, the, uh, the impact of technologies into uh, artificial intelligence, for example, into the world, uh, the impact of neuroscience, neurotechnologies into the world. 
the what I think is a disaster in terms of the lower of the standards of information sharing, uh, in which the social media have enabled essentially lowest common denominator and people are strictly uh, fed things that are not true uh, and they act according to that and the rise of populism, all of this doesn't speak very well for the world um, making use of their of our expertise. No, so uh, I think I imagine a, a much stronger stance that science could take in the world in the governance, not just in the. Uh, it, just let me just give you an example. In the, a typical country, the most important position in the cabinet is the prime minister and whoever deals with the economy. You know, the vice president of the economy, the uh, secretary of the. Uh, of the treasure or whatever you call it. Well, I would argue that even more important than the economy is the science, <laughs> because without science, forget about the economy. I mean, look look what's going on now. No? You cannot not heed the uh, the advice of scientists. Uh, and this should be something not just in the, in the governments, it should be in the parliaments. The science uh, should be there from the beginning. The, judic uh, the uh, judiciary also should be infused with science. And how about the media, the press? No, I mean, I opened the newspaper, even very reputable newspaper. They don't follow the facts and the numbers. No, they, they make stories up, taking one particular case, and they give the impression that something's going on. And then you look at the numbers and it's not accurate. No? That should not be, that should not be, uh, uh, that's not an intelligent uh, use of our, our, our smarts. I was trained as an economist a long time ago, and I firmly believe in supply and demand, and that goes back to people's demand for facts, people's demand for real information. And maybe that will be one of the upsides of, of this crisis. But I'd like to segue, Anne, to you. you uh, you've seen, we've talked about this in our podcast in the past. You've seen pandemics of, of various kind, both man-made and pathogen-made. Uh, you've coped with the science, you've thought about it, and you're deeply engaged in thinking about it now. Let's not talk to the details of the pandemic that we're currently coping with, but as a scientist, as a doctor, uh, as you look at this and think about all of your experience, what would you like, picking up a bit on, on, on where Rafa is going, what would you like to come out of this? What would you like the changes in how we think, organize, look at public health problems of the kind that you deal with? Well, thank you so much, Alan, and it is great to be here and to um, see everyone that I can see here. And, um, you know, I want to follow up and maybe ask uh, Raphael a question. So one thing I'm struck with by the by with this whole situation, and it, it really reminds me of the beginning of the AIDS epidemic when uh, uh, in many respects, but let's just take uh, Cambodia in the early 90s when it was clear that um, HIV was gonna enter into the country. Um, there was a, and, and there was just a refusal on the part of the U United Nations organization such as UNAIDS at the time that was working on the ground to accept that as a reality and to figure out how to mitigate against it. Um, what is it? And, and, and at the same time, uh, you could see these gigantic teak uh, trunks from teak trees being, you know, carted around that eventually were used for garden furniture and for chopsticks and so forth. And the, the land was deforested from, you know, I forgot what the uh, cover was exactly, but it was in the 90 percentiles and now it's like 7% of Cambodia is covered by, by forest. What is the problem in the human brain that people cannot, um, you know, forecast ahead, that they want to just uh, deny these kinds of situations? So that's sort of, it, 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 and it reminds me of the beginning of this as well. I mean, it was, we, are, we had had SARS in 2002 and the whole world escaped a bullet because it wasn't quite as infectious as this one is. Yeah. Um, and it was isolated, so it was like over there, and you know, we it was Southeast Asia and China, and we didn't have to kind of worry about it here, and so we just forgot about it. But and um, so I don't really. What is that about humans that it's uh, very it part of it? I, I don't know what it is. Is it laziness? I wonder if it's laziness on some hand, you know, aside from right. the other fear. But so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. I mean, this this question it's uh, 
as many different levels. Okay. Um, so let me just uh, have a shot at trying to answer. I think to the first uh, degree, I think the problem is ignorance. People just don't know uh, and they don't trust the future. They don't, um, they want to hold on to their past because they actually do not understand the situation and they do not comprehend how uh, uh, a prediction based on a mathematical model is going to tell you this is going to happen and lo and behold, this will happen. So uh, that's one level. Um, another level is that uh, people, that has to do also with the morality of how people act, the reasons behind people's actions. And I cannot help but to quote uh, Kant, no? and he would argue that uh, most people act out of self-interest. Uh, and there's two types of self-interest, uh, what you would call the uh, self-love, uh, and that it's good that uh, you love yourself and you do things and you love, you like people that love you because this is, Oh, good and then but the other one is self-conceit where uh, you're essentially uh, think that you're better than the rest no uh, but Kant argues that the, the real way to act uh, has to do with the moral law so you have to follow rationality reason you have to follow uh, rules that are applied universally and I think uh, you know this is why I was talking about the alignment we, we need uh, those types of thoughts to be the forefront of, of, of humanity we need our leaders a president of the government, the president of the UN, to say, guys, let's act uh, based on the on, on moral laws. Based, you can make your actions that are universal, uh, it's that they don't just apply to you; they apply to everyone else. And uh, and and that's what makes me a little bit um, upset at the whole situation. And we have the knowledge, we have the expertise. It's just we're not a very well oiled machine in in, in humanity. <laughs> And this is maybe the time to shake the machine up and get all the pieces aligned so that we can actually progress uh, forward. Because again, if you think this is a bad problem, imagine climate change, where we really may not have a, a shot at what uh, how to fix the whole the whole earth, no? or all these issues that are maybe lurking a uh, little seeping into our our lives, like the impact of technology. I mean, this crisis is very sharp. So you, from one month to the next, boom, you see it. So everyone realizes, and everyone freaks out no? but you have a situation in which it's changing year by year like the impact of technology in our in our society in our brains even uh this what i'm worried about in my work uh, how neuroscience can both have a positive impact but can also have a negative impact if it's not properly channeled all these things are, are gigantic um, uh, challenges to to humanity and, and we better be ready for 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 these things these are worse than than what we're experiencing now no? I want to connect. Yes, yep. I want to connect a yep. couple of the dots that are already on the board. But Theo, you're you're signaling that you have something to add. So it's well, add. Well, I mean, I think that everything that is being said is an analysis of you know is a is 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 a correct analysis. But I would uh, so I saw in the in the Q and A somebody saying that there is nothing more powerful than the example uh, of of you know, and many leaders don't give it. That's certainly true. But there's also nothing more powerful than the example, the, the example that is set uh, for a solution. And there's nothing more powerful than, the, than connecting the dots, as you were about to do, Alan. And by that, I mean, um, by that, I mean that uh, we measure the impact of technology beforehand. There was an old, uh, it was like it maybe mid 80s, I think. Uh, article in Scientific American that said that the most profound technological innovations are the ones that we forget about and that they get so ingrained in our everyday fabric that we don't think about them anymore. And I think that our technological, our, the, tech, the, the, the pace of technology has, has been so successful these days that we really do not connect the dots. And nobody will ever connect the dots between, or will not think intuitively at the relationship between a nail salon and polymer science. And polymer science does enable the nail, the nail salon. And the more, and the more time you spend, you spend, uh, you, and you spend through, uh, through leadership and through ingenuity in connecting the dot and conveying how how this is part and parcel of our society today and how it can affect things in the future. And if you manage them well, how they can be, how they can, how they can give positive outcomes from a very, very practical standpoint. 
then I believe that the rest follows. And then, and it means that then you can pose the question of where the moral, where the moral and the ethical implications are going to be, uh, because people are primed uh, with a love for the context and for technology. If that doesn't happen, the worlds are so disconnected that, uh, that, that, that it requires a really disruptive and catastrophic event in order to think about these things. So this to me is the great opportunity of what we're living right now. It sort of forces us to think about solutions and about the way to think about solutions in spite of all the noise that is coming, that is coming across. So, um, so I, think, I, I, I think that there's also, there's also something that can be done at a very grassroots level in terms of, in terms of thinking about, uh, about immediate things to, that will lead us then to, um, to good, to, to a healthy dialogue, uh, a healthy, most importantly, informed dialogue later on. So here's the hoping that that happens. So let me, let me grab two of those dots. One of those dots is that what we needed was a real whack across the head in order to think differently about some of our problems, maybe even to recognize some of our problems. And along comes the coronavirus, which is the first global it's really the first global crisis, at least since 1945. Um, you can debate the war, et cetera, but this is something that we're all talking about. Literally everyone on the planet is talking about the same thing for the first time in, in, in a long time, wherever you want to go back to. Good, bad, or ugly, we're at least all on the same page for the moment. Then the second question becomes, um, so what? Our capacity to operate globally is almost zero. It's being evidenced every day. We're behaving more and more locally. Uh, we've had some questions about relating the technolo technological worlds that Anne, Rafa, and Theo, you live in to the reality of Africa, uh, where you don't have the same kind of availability of infrastructure. That could be good or bad. We've talked about third and fourth transformations. Um, George, how do you, 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 you worry a lot and, and, and have worked a lot on innovation, on trying to deal with Africa's realities, which tend to be smaller business SMEs, not great big companies. How do you empower them? How do you give access to them in a world that is not going to behave globally? It wants to behave locally. How do we integrate some of the dramatic transformations that our colleagues are talking about into African realities? Alan, thank you very much. Um, I've had the, this conversation about how can we have a common understanding of the good things of life? Eh? That's how I'll summarize it. How can we get science in the minds of our leaders and in the minds of most of the people who live in this globe? And how can we sort of unify a perception over something like COVID-19? As you know, for us, like I told you, COVID-19 is an enigma, a total enigma. However, Thanks be to the fact, for whatever reason, I don't know, we've got a low level of infection in Africa. But it made me think a lot about innovation and how we can spread it across the continent like you've asked. And these are the questions that bother me most significantly. So first, I'd like to discuss the difficulties and then to try and see some of the solutions to those things. Okay, so... Um, how do you get an educated population that can understand the importance of having a service or a product? A health service, for instance, a type of medicine, um, types of foods that are good, nutritional structures for family upbringing. How, how do you get people educated? And this is one of the problems in Africa that we do not get a lot of that information that you may have there in the, in the Northern countries to everybody, okay? Probably for good or for bad, but the one thing is we do not have communication channels. Now, the other thing that we don't have precisely is interconnectivity. So uh, let's see what happens uh, negatively uh, when COVID outbreak, outbreak hits Africa, quote unquote hits Africa in March of this year. We suddenly don't have anybody who has the stock of, you know, the, uh, this thing, what do you call this thing here? Yeah. <laughs> <Right. Mask. laughs> 
<laughs> is it really a mask or a mouth cover? <laughs> mouth and nose cover. Mask means many different things. But anyway, this, this mouth cover that is, that is uh, uh, medically um, um, developed. Well, you know what? What happened is that every African continent decided to start making African masks. Now, the negative was that it took us approximately three weeks to figure out where do we get masks from, to figure out where do we get the measuring device from. And Jack Ma sent us uh, a huge number of, of uh, COVID-19, um, uh, what do you call these gadgets, that these meters that measure your temperature and all that sort of thing. Jack Ma sent that. For the, for the masks, we imported only the first ones. After that, they have been locally produced by small and medium enterprises everywhere across Africa. So in effect, what we thought would be a problem is no longer a problem. Now, the problem is, is it efficacious to use those ones made at the local level without any quality control assurance? How do we get that information to the people? Let's go to another one, which is fundamental. Um, Kenya developed, and uh, we are working a lot here at the university on that, on software applications in finance. You all have heard of the M-Pesa application, which uh, uh, to, to summarize, grew access to cash from an average of 27% in the country here in this country to 85% access to cash money. I'm talking about bills. And it's just simply a technology of transferring mobile wallets across the country. That spread like wildfire and took approximately um, two years, three years to reach out the whole country. That was amazing. What made that so powerful? Now think about Africa in general, 1.3 billion people. You know what? It has caught up everywhere, okay? that people can actually transfer money from Kenya all the way to 6,500 kilometers away in Nigeria on the mobile platform. And most of all, the Kenyans working in the US, we have more than 400,000 Kenyans there. Uh, I don't know the figure, but it's around there. Okay, 400,000 Kenyans, they can send M-Pesa money to their families here in Kenya. And they are for actually one of the most important uh, export value we have in the country is money from Kenyans working abroad. That's a really huge figure in our uh, developments. I think it's the third or fourth level uh, contribution to foreign exchange in the country. Now, how do we get mobile, mobile technology that can transfer and avail mobile wallets to people? How can we link that to an efficient banking service? You see, we have not only problems of connectivity, but also difficulties in transforming the systems that we have acquired from the West, right? So for instance, uh, if I may go slightly technical, one of the things that you could do to support information of whatever kind, for instance, if you want to allow a farmer, a young person, to have education, a farmer to have access to a banking service like a loan or a, an overdraft or, or something like that. Now, what happens is um, you could use a thin, slim uh, technology over the phone cell technology, and it works. But now, how are you going to make banks and telecommunications work together? Okay, so we have a problem of accepting innovation, just like we've heard from Fiorenzo, from Rafael Yuste, and the question that Anne Goldfield asked. How, how do we get people to try new innovations that are quickly going to transform the economic structure of the country? Now, uh, lastly, uh, we need our youth educated properly. Um, our education system is not doing exactly what it ought to do. And that is to uh, develop uh, an educated population. I think from an education capacity, Kenya has 13 years, uh, 11 years of average education per person. South Africa probably has close to 13, 14, I don't know. Uh, most of Africa has below 10 years, 11 years of education per person. 
How do you get people more educated? We are trying, but it's very, very hard. And people who are not education, educated cannot consume technology. Now, somebody, Toti Jean, has asked me um, about how can we get computers to schools? <laughs> After the joke is up to much. Uh, no kid should bring a mobile phone into class. Right? <laughs> After March 2020, <laughs> every kid should go to the mobile phone and to the computer for class. Okay, we, we see the, the uh, contradictions of life. So what has happened is that now governments in Africa are running to ensure technology can be brought to every person in the country. But we were not ready for it, so it's going to take some time. And uh, suddenly COVID-19 has made it uh, clear that technology is not a negative for education. Precisely, it can be a very good tool for education. We are working on education platforms and content development here at Strathmore, and we are spreading it across. But again, how do you get people to move from their comfortable face-to-face -face learning and teachers to something more productive like information books, uh, instruction on the computer, but with a blended system. How do we do those things? Those are the negative things, positive things. Uh, look, the, at the overall level, um, the African Union has revived and it is now trying to integrate the different economic regions which are about 12 in total intermingled and mixed and confused and probably bringing them to one. And the most important part of that is the Africa continental free trade area that was signed last year. That has already come into play. And we are already working on a common um, currency amongst the region. We are working towards a common platform for financial exchange. We are already working on platforms for currency uh, distribution that are reasonable for, uh, for the African. Should we continue working with the dollar or should we find a new you know, Bitcoin okay, for Africa. We don't know, but, but we are working at it to see that happens. We are already working on the African interconnectivity through the AU, the transport interconnectivity system, so that goods can move from Kenya to Nigeria over 5,000 kilometers away on railroad. Eh? So how do we structure standardizations? How do we structure skills? We are working on sk skill and certification for quality skills in schools. Um, you see, Alan, uh, we do not have centers that can build these things um, in a consolidated way across the continent. We have very um, fractured, we are very uh, disintegrated as a continent. And that's sad. Mm. It's very sad. And because of that, it's very costly to distribute goods, to distribute money, even in this country. But it's true, we are affected by climate change. We are affected by rains or no rains, sun or no sun, uh, floods or no floods. Like right now, we are suffering from floods the last two years, significant floods. And that means that uh, our productivity at the small and medium enterprise land buying. Uh, companies or individuals, they can't produce as much as they want, just enough for the subsistence. <clears throat> Irrigation is there. How can we develop it across Africa? Um, I don't know, but I think if there's one thing that the world can help us, is to try and make use of the gifts of Africa, which are enormous, like alternative energy sources instead of going to nuclear and hydrogen power. That you, in medicine, that you come and study artemisium, the plant that most local farmers and local populations have been using to eradicate malaria, to eradicate, uh, you know, infections. We have uh, the, uh, the neem tree, the neem tree in Kenya, uh, and in the rest of Africa. The neem tree is known scientifically to cure four, 40 diseases or something like that. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that artemisin is, is planted, then exported out, and the medicines come back as malaria. Mm -hmm. how, how, how do we also, and this is a funny way of looking at it, 
how do we also get rid of the technology that is not suitable for Africa? I'll give you an example. In the North, Germany, uh, South America, especially Brazil and Argentina and, uh, and, um, and, and China, we have all these big tractors and machineries for planting and planting efficiently, for harvesting and harvesting efficiently and spraying and spraying efficiently. Do we really need those sprays that are artificial? Number two, why don't you reduce the size of the tractor to suit the small scale farmer rather than try to get the farmer out of his land or her land and the families from their basic subsistence and try to put them in an urban center so that you can increase the size of the land? Why don't we just reduce the size of the tractors? If we reduce the size of the tractors, most likely we will have good solar energy solutions for the powering of those, uh, the, those capacities. Now you may ask me, why don't we integrate all this? Well, it takes time to urbanize naturally. Some say that the urbanization in Europe has been because of uh, probably wars, more wars than normal, and the need to, to live together in a bit more security. Here in Africa, we still can live in the rural areas quite comfortably. Well, and, and in fact, I think one consequence is in the rest of the world, we want to socially distance so maybe we reverse some of our urbanization. But what I'd like to do is to pick up on some of that, George, and spend the last few minutes, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I'd like to talk about ethics, morality. Uh, we've talked, we've mentioned several times, humanity, values. Um, and the title of this, of this conversation uh, includes the bad and the ugly. Now, one of the things we know about technology is that technology by definition is neutral. It's what people do with technology. You just gave a couple examples of less than great use of technology. Um, but historically, whether it's nuclear fission, fission whether it is nitrogen, you, you name that technology um, and you can put it to good uses, you can put it to bad uses, and you can put it to ugly uses. So, so Anne, let me go to you next. Um, as you, you're, you're on the front line of, of a lot of health issues. You're on the front line of a lot of investigative, scientific investigative issues as you look for solutions to this particular problem. Um, how do you, and I'll ask Rafa and Fio next, uh, how do you think about that ethical question? You are a medical doctor. Uh, you took an oath a long time ago to, to do good, not evil. Um, but a lot of people out there are much better at doing evil and, and, and bad things. Um, how, how, do we, how do we somehow go from a, a world that needs more values than it has? How, how do we use this to get to a world with more values in its leadership, in its followership, in its educational systems? How do we, how do we become a little more, more, more human? That's an easy question. I apologize. Well, I mean, on one hand, it is, it is easy because we see it all around us right now. Uh, we see, uh, you know, people volunteering to go to New York to, uh, to be nurses and uh, doctors and so forth and so on. We see all sorts of people stepping right up and it's quite remarkable and it's very inspiring. And I think it, it really reminds me that, so the thing about this, uh, this situation is that it really transcends all the politics with even with all the efforts to politicize it and to degrade the responses but it 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 supersedes and people's common humanity is being displayed on a constant basis here uh, from you know from the caregivers to the firemen to the policemen to the to all sorts of people who are who are stepping up and so I think that should be something very important for us all to be highly inspired by we're also seeing the earth heal a little bit in this moment of less carbon pollution um, so we're seeing um, we're seeing our better selves we're seeing a healing earth uh, and we're seeing cooperation at, for example, at Harvard or in all, of, there's a Massachusetts co uh, consortium of um, scientists who are collaborating in a way that I have, it, you couldn't possibly imagine people showing their data, the completely unpublished data, 
um, cutting edge ideas being shared, uh, linking themselves together, uh, and really trying to solve different aspects of this problem. So I think that, um, and you know, again, and I, I hate to, I sound like ridiculous, I'm always harking back, but it also reminds me of the landmine campaign, which was also beyond politics, that you could have people who, you know, were at all ends of the political spectrum, but they uh, understood from a human standpoint that to have landmines in, a, in the land is not acceptable. So I think somehow uh, a problem, what we're seeing as things kind of fray with this, um, the, com the competition between the economics and what is clear, it's better that we would keep uh, sheltering in place, so to speak, for a while longer. Um, is, uh, and then the, you know, the politics that are coming out and aligning against, uh, against sort of rational solutions is problematic. So I think it goes back to uh, things that uh, m multiple people have said here, and that is uh, we have to have a common knowledge base. And that, that's what's so uh, not, uh, it, we, we're getting, you know, all sorts of interpretations from the beginning. So from, and the, the first steps were the denial that we really had a problem. And that's what I was trying to talk about with the, it was the same situation with HIV in many places. Um, and so uh, once we came to that conclusion, then we have to all have a solution that we more or less all agree on. And that has to be led by the facts. And the fact that we have this history in recently of all these different facts um, and not the facts is, leads people to not trust. And so we have to, again, um, elevate truth, whatever that is, but there is some truth about, um, you know, uh, and we need to elevate that. And um, I think the other lesson is that the lack of cooperation that we've seen, let's say between China and the United States currently, or between the complete transparency as this virus evolved, we see that the, what when, We've been able to conquer big problems, particularly big medical problems, pandemic problems. It's all been through co collaboration and cooperation, smallpox, measles, um, uh, polio, uh, so forth and so on. And um, so it seems to me that from this, we have to learn that we have to be, have a transparent system because we're an end a transparent way of responding. And, um, you know, and so, uh, and I wonder if it also requires, I was thinking about uh, Rafa's comment about people sitting on the bench and my, the image that came to mind is like reserve duty in Israel where everyone has been in the army for three years and then for every year you go for two weeks on reserve duty, um, you drop your life and you go do a task. And maybe we all need to be trained in tasks we can do, because I think most people really want to want to be part of that. Um, and, um, you know, and then the other things, you know, everyone has talked about it uh, in the, you know, any channel you turn on television or anything you read, um, you know, the scientific platforms we need, and they have to be shared with Africa and with the global South. Uh, and they have, and the drug solutions have to be um, compatible uh, with those environments as well. Um, and one thing, and so, um, so there's many things we, we could actually creatively, uh, you know, develop from this, um, starting from knowledge and starting from, um, you know, transparency and collaboration. Thank you, Ann. Rafa, could you give us just maybe uh, 60 seconds on your initiative, uh, because it is a, it is a global initiative it, that, that you're pushing to try to get people to recognize both the problem that you touched on a moment ago, but also the need to recognize neural identities in a new way since no one ever thought about them before. Um, yeah, this has to do with the human rights. So uh, we're saying earlier that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, comes about as a reaction to the disaster of Second World War. No? And that has established, we're talking about morality, the uh, 
moral backbone of the world uh, since 1948. And we think that it's due for an update. It hasn't been touched since then. And we think we, uh, we're proposing with a group of likely minded uh, scientists and, and, and people interested in, in ethics and in these types of issues, uh, we're proposing to add to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights new human rights that instead of being the rights of the individuals would be the rights of the brains of the individuals uh, because technology, both uh, neurotechnology and artificial intelligence are uh, have the potential to erode some of the basic uh, characteristics that makes us human. And we think these need to be protected and we're talking about uh, mental privacy, the privacy of our own thoughts, uh, our own identity, our self, our own free will, our capacity to make uh, decisions, free decisions, and also our uh, the uh, equality to uh, mental or cognitive augmentation. This is something, talking about challenges that are in our future, this is something that comes straight to us, the ability of humans to use technology to enhance our mental abilities and how this is not going to be uh, cheap technology is going to happen in certain groups of individuals in certain countries first and that can fracture society into the uh, people that are augmented and people that are not augmented into types of humans so these things should be all ruled from the principle of justice again going back to can drawing inspiration from the heart of the renaissance uh universal moral law that we have to uh, to come about and how do we do that strengthening the um, international institutions. It was actually Kant who first proposed the idea of a UN and a world governance that would abolish all wars. It would be the end of war because why would you need to fight against country if you're all playing for the same team? Uh, and uh, I think strengthening international institutions, bringing these ideas like new human rights to strengthen that uh, ethical backbone of humanity. And as I was saying earlier, um, to bring science to the forefront. No, that involves science, scientists in the governments, in the governance, the science education, as uh, George is saying. Uh, we need to make the society understand uh, what science is. And actually, these Talberg initiatives, like this panel, is a wonderful way to, to do that, you know, in, uh, communicate between scientists and the, and the public. And of course, science investment and science based information, as Anne, Anne was saying. Theo, you're an engineer, which means you're a practical sort, of, at least part of you is a practical sort of guy who's trying to make things that will make the world better. Um, but you could also make things that would make the world worse. And how do you and engineers, how do you think about that, that, that moral problem, how to do good and avoid evil? It sounds, sounds sort of silly. It sounds what our parents taught us when we were, we were babies. We as a global society seem to have forgotten that. But, but how do you as engineers think about it? Well, uh, I, I think I think in thirty you know, seconds or less. Whether whether we as engineers think about it, or whether we as scientists or we as people think about it, I think it's a bit. I think a bit. It's a bit of the same thing. Um, we try to lead by example and put our best foot forward to do to do the best that we can. And to me, that means you know, uh, that means thinking about all of the things that Rafa outlined, all of the things that Anne outlined, all of the things that George outlined, and all of the things that I've seen come in the question and answer, uh, in the question and answer session. I think that with that you know, um, two. I want to make two quick points. I mean, one. One is I really, I really echo one of the things that George was saying that is that I think education is at the root of all of this and education is crucial. And to me, you know, this comes with the joy of solving problems. If you have people that start early to be trained to solve things, uh, if then, then you build curiosity, you build, you build a sense of wonder, you build a way to look at things that is very different. This is fostered by education. It gives you an awareness of context when you do that. And then it, it enables somebody to come to the table and talk about these things. And then you have, you have a generation of, uh, you have a new generation of informed leaders of that, that will be able to, um, to really talk, uh, talk about the solutions with, uh, um, with a sense, with a sense of what it means to find a solution. Because when you're trying to solve a big problem, you quickly realize that you need help. And what Anne was saying about the consortiums and people coming together and sharing data is something that you see. You see a lot of these things that ordinarily you, di you didn't see 
any anymore. And I think that this that this is not that that it would be a mistake not to take this and shift it back to uh, shift it back to earlier stages of education where these where this type of approach to problem solving allows you to get uh, to get somewhere. And I believe that this actually becomes um, more importantly, also a global way of solving problems. So not also so only solutions for one part of the world where you have access to uh, to a lot of tools, but solutions that are truly global and that apply and apply in places where where resources are different. So so that's one thing. And then you know at the risk of shooting myself in the foot, um, you know scientists uh, scientists are fallible too. So it's important to have to have this discourse and this 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 confrontation with a lot of other people. Uh, so, uh, so I think, I think having informed the, the way that I think about it is having a counterpart to argue with and to, and to go and, and to have very passionate discussions about these things that hope ultimately lead to a good outcome in the end. Um, I mean, Teller was a scientist, right? So, uh, <laughs> thank you. So George, we're in overtime, but great games always go into overtime. Um, can you last few words on, 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 and bring us back to Africa, please? But bring us off mute. You got me there, Alan. Um, Iboro has asked a question about corruption and corruption in Africa, and I think. I'll rotate about these particular points, that probably the ethical moral situation is about um, reaching out to humanity, making their lives better. It's about safeguarding this gift that we have called the universe and especially um, our world, uh, our land, our trees, our flora and fauna, the beautiful diversity of the earth. I think there's something about ethics and morals which should deal with always trying to get the best solution for most of the people in the world. Now, if we apply that principle in Africa, we are going to see that we will build technology in Africa that will enable most people leave poverty. Like I said, and I will not stop it, one of the key problems in Africa has been the lack of access to an, a medium of economics like money. Uh, we need to solve that. I've talked about finding substitutions for the failures that COVID has brought with it in our economy. So for instance, we, can, we see a lot of people deliver in the delivery and supply chain system of every sort of thing in this country, because now you can't visit the shop, but the shop can visit you through transportation, through Uber systems, through motorcycle systems, through Jumia systems, and this is very good. And it can also apply to the technologies of transportation for bringing healthcare to the people through um, ambulances. Uh, we need to look at reducing the cost of technology. I tried to get that thing across to Zoom, but uh, I haven't passed that yet. I have to pay for my poor students who do not have an income of $1.9 a day. I have to tell them to pay $7 to try and get access to Zoom um, at, per month. And, and that's crazy for me. Yet if I have a government as a private institution will come to my help. Uh, the, the, the modern West has to invest in Africa. And I assure you, without worrying about payback, the amount of money you will invest in technologies that support the poor will get paid back 1,000%, because as you go down the bottom of the pyramid, more people are absorbed into the economy and therefore they pay. Even if it is a small thing per person, it comes to you, just like we found out with M-Pesa and the increase in number of uh, money to people based on simple charges. And with that, I finally come to just one point. Partnership. If uh, one of the projects we want to do with USAID um, that's the United States Aid for International Development, is to set up small business communities in all the regions of Kenya, starting with eight. And using those small uh, business communities, we are going to help them live an economic environment that is conducive to their community modes and morals, which we find are less corrupt. 
and they will own the economy. So uh, I hope it works. And if it works, then what we will find is that the business community, a small and business, business community of the United States will work with the small and business community in Kenya to develop a market-based development of products and services. So I am not here to ask for free money. All I know is that the other day, and it's very simple and I finish with this, I found out that in one of the villages in a far flung village in Kenya, I saw three young men develop a respiratory uh, machine for their hospital using wood and uh, car instruments. There is the capacity to absorb technology there is the capacity to absorb new models for uh, better living, development, medicine, and so on. If the West would stop crying wolf about Africa and come and partner with it, and we Africans open ourselves to partnering with the European and the Americans and all the people of the world who want to help. Thank you very much. And in that spirit, that is part of the reason why you and I are trying to build this partnership between SBS and the Telberg Foundation as one of the axes, perhaps, that can, can contribute to the conversation, contribute to the movement of people and ideas, far more importantly, uh, between Kenya and not just the United States, where I happen to sit at the moment, um, but, but the rest of the world. Absolutely. We promised to end promptly at an hour. We're, of course, as I said, in overtime. Uh, that's always a good problem to have. I want to first thank everyone who is listening uh, to us. We will do this again. We'll do it again soon. Uh, we will try to answer your questions, as I promised, and post those answers on the websites uh, so you have access to it. I want to secondly thank uh, you, George, and Rafa and Theo for your time today, uh, for your engagement in uh, these issues, and most importantly, for the thing that you are best at, which is your leadership. Uh, because absent great leaders, uh, this mess becomes impossible to solve. So thank you for all of that. Uh, two commercials, speaking of leadership. Uh, the Telberg Foundation, as I mentioned at the start, is trying to encourage uh, global, values-based, innovative leadership. Uh, there's the ad now, uh, which is indeed um, the only thing that I believe can really take us from where we are to where we want to be, where we deserve to be. If you know a great leader, if you're thinking about leadership, please nominate that leader. Uh, this is a process to try to find leaders from anywhere we can find them, uh, any sector we can find them in. Uh, um, it's in your interest that we try to promote this kind of leadership. And then finally, in terms of conversations, um, we will have a conversation like this one, but quite different from this one tomorrow, in partnership with the American University of Cairo, where we are going to be talking politics, global order amidst Global Disorder, uh, and that is hosted by uh, the Telberg Foundation and the uh, School for Advanced Public Policy at AUC, whose dean is uh, Nabil Fahmy, uh, one of the great diplomats of the, uh, of the last years. So thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Alan. Great. Fantastic. Right, George, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you. Anne.